Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplant Tea Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me and in front of me today, I talk about tropical houseplants. Now this is a continuation of the plant review series and this is an update review on the plant that you can see in front of me, which is the Philodendron biliettiae. I will link up the other review that I did about a year ago now, and if I'm not mistaken, I have now had this plant in my care for three years, but I will add it up on the title as well. And I just wanted to give you a bit of an update because I know this is one that a lot of people were interested in. This has gone through a lot of changes, obviously the new conservatory is here now, and it's in a new position, usually right behind me, but I thought I'd bring it up a bit closer and we can touch on it a bit more today. I'll bring it up and show it to you and I will add a few close-up clips throughout. Hopefully also do some B-roll at the very end of the video. Now, before we get into any more of the specifics, let's lay down some ground rules. So if you are one of the regulars and is coming back for more, <laughs> welcome back, it's nice to have you. By this point, you know that you can skip to your favorite chapter down below in the progress bar. And if you are new, these kind of Ground rules are really for you. So the way that I like to start off these ground rules is that there is no way for me to make this review unbiased. It is my biased opinion on my specific plant in my specific conditions, which if you're just joining is me growing my tropical indoor house plants in a conservatory in the UK and whatever that might mean in terms of light, humidity, dryness, heat, cold, <laughs> all of the above. Some of the plants that I will review I do also have in household conditions, so I will talk a bit more about this. This used to be one of the plants that was in regular household humidity, and it has since moved into what is the kind of conservatory. Think of it as a giant terrarium essentially at this point. But yeah, without further ado, let's go into the first topic. So coming into background for this plant, I'm wiping off like spider webs, not spider mite webs, spider webs. Fine by me if there's a few spiders in this space, because it generally means that they are eating the rest of the pests. But yeah, so this is a plant that's quite an interesting one. I've got the green form of this plant and I'll bring it up and show you a bit closer. So you can see that is the all green form. You can see some of the older leaves. It is in a semi-hydro mix, and you can see the root for days, as well as the new growth point. I'm trying to show you without hiding half the plant. That is the new growth point. So this is a plant, as I was saying, that a lot more people I think are aware or are kind of in desperate want of the variegated form of this. And I've never owned the variegated form, so I can't really comment on that, I know a few people that have got the variegated form have posted about it on their channel, so I'll let you discover it there if you're looking for the variegated one. But a lot of the things that I'm saying will probably apply both in terms of the morphology and everything else that goes around this plant. It's just that this one isn't the variegated one. Now, the thing about this plant, and there was a bit of controversy, but there was a beautiful moment online, I think this was on Instagram, and I think it happened during the pandemic when everybody was in lockdowns basically, and it was a case where the scientist that kind of discovered the plant, or basically came across it and helped with the naming of the plant, is still kind of with us and still around. So she was able to kind of necessarily correct. There is something in the plant community, as long as you're trying to pronounce the name, that's good enough basically. We're not always all going to get it 100% right. But this was a plant that a lot of people, and still to this day, um, will call it Bilitai. Uh, and the scientists themselves, she came online and I think as I said it was on Instagram, and she said actually if it's based on my name it would be Philodendron Bilietiae. So that's the kind of more correct pronunciation, if I'm not mistaken, basically. So we all learn, and it's kind of cool when things like that happen because we don't get it very often. A lot of the people that plants are named after might not still be around, so they can't necessarily say, actually, 
if it's based on my name, this is roughly how you would pronounce it, basically. The more kind of Latin-based names tend to be a bit more straightforward in the fact that we think that's how it's said, but yeah. So it's also a plant that a lot of people will get, and it's a shame because I don't think mine has it right now. You might be able to see some of it. You can see the petioles, and that's kind of a bit of a trademark for this plant. The petioles are usually quite long, so you can see the, the stem is there and all of this is petiole. And usually it's people will get it because it's got kind of bright orange petioles. Now, I tend to find that with mine, it depends on the time of the year and depends if it's an active growth, whether or not I'm going to get really, really strong orange petioles. It tends to be stronger when there's a new leaf that's just emerged and that specific petiole is a much much brighter orange. I find, at least with mine, when some time has passed and the leaves have hardened off and it's kind of waiting for its next leaf to come through, those petioles tend to kind of dial back to a kind of more greeny, orangey kind of... I don't know how I would describe it. Something between a brown and a khaki? It's bizarre. It's not a traditional colour even now for... Um, a kind of standard green petiole, but it is one of those features that is quite unique about this plant. And the other thing I will say, it is also a plant that does change, not hugely in terms of morphology, but it does change a bit. So this was one of the original leaves that I got with it, which was one of the more juvenile leaves. And you can see that it has got some of that telltale kind of lobing at the top and that very deep sinus there. This is another one of the original leaves, which is why it's so, so bleached out. But you can see as it gets larger, things get a lot more pronounced. So you can see that sinus is a lot deeper. You can see the back of the leaves as well, if I can actually get it in a decent angle without dropping everything down. You can see the back of the leaf there and you can see kind of what structure is with the midrib and everything else. It is also a plant that's been notoriously tricky to propagate. And I'll touch a bit more on that in the propagation side of things. But, uh, oh, and actually I'll do what I usually do. And here I will add a picture of what this plant looked like when I first got it. And it was considerably smaller, basically. Some of you might also be looking at the picture and kind of going, you've had it for three years, it's not particularly large. <laughs> we'll come on to that in the speed of growth, because <laughs> I do have a few things to say about that. But I think that's what I wanted to cover on the background section, let's move on. So coming into <laughs> speed of growth, <laughs> like by magic, yeah. There is no two ways around this. This has got to be not the slowest philodendron that I've got in my collection, but one of the slowest philodendron that I've got in my collection. Because again, three year plant, and okay, I've got some of the original leaves. They're not all on there, but I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight leaves, eight leaves, and I've had it for three years. So, <laughs> that tells you something. It is a particularly slow, slow philodendron to get going, and you need to be aware of that if you're going to be getting this. This also explains why the price is what it is. Again, I'll touch a bit more on that and availability, but yeah, this is not going to be one that you're going to grow super, super fast, essentially. If you want kind of more of the strappy leaves that have still got some of that ruffling that you're seeing at the front, which can get a lot larger and you want something a bit faster, I would actually almost say, see if you can get something like the Esmeralda Dense behind me. That will be a lot faster, especially when it's a bit more juvenile. As it gets older, yes, it does slow down a bit in order to create those mahusive leaves, but this is one that is quite, quite slow. On that point, times that by two, three, four, and you've got the speed of growth from what I'm hearing on the variegated one. <laughs> Which kind of makes sense. I mean, we know this. We know that if plants are variegated, they are less efficient in terms of photosynthesizing because they've got those large chunks on the leaves which have got the variegation, which means they cannot photosynthesize on those 
variegated white or creamy sections, which means that by default, the plant is even slower. So <laughs> I do fully appreciate when I see a lot of my kind of online planty friends that have got the variegated form of this leaf, of this plant, that when they do get a variegated leaf, they really do celebrate it. It's all over their Instagram. Some people might be sitting there going, why do you keep showing us new leaves? I know we all share new leaves and we all get a bit excited, but with this, I truly, truly get it because I would imagine if it's any slower, <laughs> if it's any slower than the all green form, then yes, every new leaf is a celebration. I can also understand the frustration when it comes to the variegated form of people where I think, again, based on what I'm seeing, I'm not an expert because I don't have that plant, not that I would be an expert if I did have that plant, but what I'm saying is I'd be talking more from experience. With that one, if the leaves that come through and it's kind of, I think it's highly unstable variegation. If the leaves don't always bring out variegation and you get one green leaf and then you have to wait and hope that the next one is gonna be variegated unless you decide to go critical at that point and chop it back to the previous variegated leaf, all of these things are going to slow down the growth of this plant further. <laughs> so something to bear in mind. But yeah, this is no two ways around it. It's a slow growing philodendron. As I said, not the slowest, but it's slow growing. So coming into propagation, and another one that has a bit of a challenge with this one, I'll bring it up so you might be able to see this a bit closer. I'm gonna get very, very close at the moment. But can you see the stem? Let me show you where that new growth point is coming in. That stem is about this big for a plant this size. And granted, I know that I'm pulling up the petioles, and again, I'll come onto that on accessories and care. The good thing is you can see from mine, and I think this might be true for a lot of people's, it does have loads and loads of aerial roots. So in that respect, it would you would assume it's relatively easy to propagate because it's gonna give out aerial roots all the time. However, and I'll see if I can bring it in and show you a bit closer. Can you see how close that internodal spacing is? <laughs> so the space between the nodes that we would have to go in and make a cut and with this one, I don't think there's a way around it in terms of how you would take it. You would need something like a sterilized knife. A pair of scissors or secretaires on this, when you've got really tight spaces to go with, is challenging, let me tell you this. Which is another reason why people that do have the variegated form do stress a bit more about it, basically, because it's, it's tricky that you don't want to really destroy the plant whilst you're trying to take a cutting. The other thing to bear in mind, and it, if you manage to take the cut and you've got a decent aerial root, does it root out particularly fast? Not hugely. Does it have a good success rate? Generally, yes. Obviously, you'd need to let that cut section callus over, and by that I just mean let it dry out for a day or two in kind of regular household humidity, and then try to propagate it in something like damp sphagnum moss, perlite, semi-hydro mix, all of these things. I have never tried water with this, so I wouldn't be able to tell you 100%, but yeah, it's still gonna be a bit slow. And it, I mean, that is consistent, basically. The slowness is consistent on the propagation, it's consistent on the growth. So something to bear in mind there that this will take a while, it'll take a beat. It's not impossible, but it's slightly more tricksy than what we might find with other philodendrons that have got more of that space there, basically. <laughs> so coming into availability with this one, and you can maybe guesstimate what I'm gonna say here. These are not cheap plants. This wasn't a cheap plant when I got it, and it was quite a small and juvenile plant when I got it. And I'll, I'll say this, when I got the more juvenile form, I had a lot of people that did have a more mature form that started off as a juvenile form, and they all pretty much said the same, they all reached out to me and they said the same thing, they're just like, you should have spent a bit more money and just gone for the bigger one. Back then, I got my small, kind of more immature plant 
for kind of mid double digits. And I still think it's around there. Generally, from what I can see, it might have dropped slightly. And again, this is based on my location in the UK currently. As I said, three years ago, it was around the same price, basically. The larger, kind of more established forms like this, and you probably wouldn't get it with quite so many leaves. You might get it with two leaves, maybe three leaves. You are starting to look at treble digits there, basically. You're starting to look at low, low treble digits, but it's still going to be in the treble digits. The variegated form of this, especially if you're getting something that's a bit more mature, and again, you'll have a few leaves, and again, based on the level of variegation that you're going to get. I haven't checked it recently, but I do remember two or three years ago, these were going in the quadruple digits. I would imagine this has probably dropped down to treble digits, but I would imagine they would be on the high side. Now, based on everything I've just said about the slow speed of growth, the, the kind of trickiness of the propagation, the slightly unstable nature of the variegated form as well, and the green form as well. It's not unstable, but it's the, the slowness and all of these things hold true. This is one of the rare few plants that I would say probably isn't going to drop too drastically in price. I don't think this is going to be a plant that we're going to start seeing cropping up all over the place in different stores for single digits, basically, ever because it's slow. Like, the reality is, in order to get the plant to this stage, you or whoever would be selling it to you, especially if it's a business and it's not an individual, would have had to have grown this, cared for this, and all that comes along with it in terms of time for a good few years before they can get it to you. Again, multiply that for the variegated form as well. And again, if you were thinking of the ans the kind of unstable nature of the variegated form as well, compounding the aspect of how slow it grows. Because when I first saw some of these prices, especially for the variegated plant, I'm just like, that's insane. I kind of get it. I kind of get it. It's not fast and it's not the most straightforward to propagate. So it kind of does make sense. And I, as I said, I don't think the price is going to change drastically for this plant when you're looking at that. The other thing as well is that how available is it in the market? I'm not going to lie, I have seen this crop up a bit more frequently recently, at least here in the UK. I think a seller that I keep seeing having these in stock on a semi-frequent level is Grow Tropicals. And I don't know if I've ever seen it on any other retailer on a regular basis. You do occasionally crop up, but the prices are quite high. And again, based on what I can see on a lot of the retailers, this isn't a plant that comes in and goes super fast. So you don't get that kind of notion that you might get with the Gloriosa when it first hit the market, where there was quite a few people selling it, but it was in such high demand that as soon as something would come into stock, it would leave stock almost instantly. This isn't one that I tend to find will have the same kind of issue. But again, how long it takes, how many people are willing to propagate this, how many people are willing to buy this as well? Because structurally, it's an interesting plant and it's not the most easy plant to kind of have in your space. And we'll touch a bit more on that, on those petioles and things like that in the accessories and care section. So yeah, all of this to say that the availability and the price points kind of make sense to me. So coming into pests for this one, and this is a positive part of the video, not a huge amount of pests that I've generally had on this plant, and I'll show you on here. I'm trying to see if there's any damage that you might be able to see. There was a point where there was some spider mites, and I don't know if that's getting blown out in the screen, but that's pretty much been it. And for the people that have been here for a while know that I generally struggle with mealybugs in my space. This isn't one that generally has that problem. So do with that what you will. But generally not a bad, bad plant. And I will show you something else that's quite interesting. And I've noted this, I don't know, this is just my own kind of conjecture basically. But if I bring this in a bit closer, hopefully that's going to pick up. Possibly, if not, I'll make sure that I get some close-ups. Can you see those little droplets on the main 
mid stem there and i'll see if i can get some pictures of where it is on the petiole in the back as well this is one that does get extra floral nectaries which is what you're seeing there that is and i've done a whole video and i'll see if i can find it and link it at the top there but essentially it's a sugary substance that the plant releases and it's essentially it calling in the cavalry in the form of ants in the wild to come and kind of feast on that kind of sugary liquid and what that then does is it creates an army that protects it from other pests and it's interesting because i would have assumed when plants do that it means they're more susceptible to pests so they're trying everything that they can in order to kind of protect themselves but and i will go out on a limb here and again this is only based on my experience and some conjecture that i can make most of my plants that have got heavy kind of extra floral nectary production so they do produce it in abundance i'm thinking also of and i'm looking at it down below behind the camera my piper sylvaticum which get, they kind of crystallize in the back and they kind of go into this salt and pepper like kind of white and black crystals in the back all of those plants that have got extra floral nectaries for me tend to almost be pest resistant I have no ants on this plant, so that none of these plants are getting protected by the cavalry that they're calling in by producing the extra floral nectaries. But interestingly, I find that a lot of pests don't aren't attracted to them. I'm trying to think if there's any exception to that rule, and I cannot think of that at any example of that at the moment. So I'd be really interested. Have you got plants that are very heavy with their extra floral nectaries? There's other issues there, obviously, you could get fungus and all of these things because of that. But in terms of pests, if you've got really kind of heavy extra floral nectary producing plants, do you find that they get a lot of pests or do you actually find, and this might be one that you might only just think about it now because I'm asking you, do you find that they don't get pests as often? I'd be really curious to find out. Let me know down below. Really, really curious on that one because I think that might be something to kind of look into a bit further, actually. But yeah, that's that's a big thing with pests as well. This is relatively pest resistant. So coming into accessories and care, and I'll show you some of the things to bear in mind with this plant. And you might have the eagle eyed amongst you might have already spotted it. Can you see that I've got a plant tie there that I can kind of move up? and it brings those leaves in a bit closer. Because if I don't have that plant eye there, which I'm trying to show you now, there, these petioles have the tendency to just want to do that. And then nobody got time for that in their household because that just becomes a very wide plant and not a very tall plant. I mean, that might be something that you might want to, I potentially say that. I'm correcting myself here. If I had it at the very top of a plant shelf and I had space around for it to kind of cascade down, that might be something that I'd be quite interested in. I know a lot of people are used to seeing it in this formation because actually when you slowly lift up those petioles and kind of attach them all in that center point there, the leaves will drop down in this kind of vertical format so they can get the light. And it is, I get now why a lot of people will kind of have the plant in this form because it's a lot more aesthetically pleasing and it's a lot more compact. In that scenario, this is a relatively compact plant. You don't really need a moss pole. You can give it a moss pole. I think I've seen some people online recently that have given this moss pole and it will help. But is it necessary? Not particularly, I don't find. I don't think, and I don't know because I've never grown it on a moss pole, I don't think you would get any larger leaves or any faster growth by having it on a moss pole. You're extending the pot essentially, but just put it in a different pot. I did have this in soil. I've had this, and by soil I mean an aroid soil mix. I've had it in lechuza pond which was a smaller semi-hydro i have since put it into the horse semi-hydro mix from soil ninja and i will say i think this is the happiest it's ever been 
without taking too much of a knock and it grows quite considerably fast so it is quite quite good. The other thing that I have found in terms of the care for this plant, this is one of the philodendrons that I find can lean towards root rot a bit faster than the other plants which is why I've got it in the coarse semi-hydromix. Also I'll bring it up again so you can see it. If you look at how chunky those aerial roots are and there, a lot of the roots that are in the pot are the same. So it did okay, as I said, with the Lechuza Pond, which was slightly smaller pebbles. It did a lot better with this because it's got more spaces for it to move around. And it's generally a lot happier. In terms of light levels with this, this previously, before the new conservatory happened, was at the very top. It's still here. It's getting a lot of direct lights, not full direct. There's still some shading that's happening in this conservatory. But actually, it does appreciate that kind of higher light level. I will say it's one of the philodendrons that doesn't shy away from the high, high temperatures. It doesn't tend to bleach out. Um, and I have had issues with how much light is coming in. I am dealing with this in the new conservatory. I am learning. But this one isn't one that's been affected too much. Unfortunately, my melanochrysum at the back is looking a bit worse for wear for quite how much light it's getting. But this is... This is one that can be quite tolerant of the higher light levels. Now, will this do better in lower light levels? It will, but again, you need to start balancing out, especially depending on the how much you would want this to be a bit faster, how low the light you want to give it. Because the lower the light you give it, yes, you might get some, and I'll show you when it was in the slightly lower light conditions. I can show you one of the older leaves. So that is a much darker leaf than that, really. But you will get the darker leaves. You'll also get very slow growth rates. So something to decide there. I mean, the leaves are quite leathery, so they're not too, too bad. Does it need an awful lot of watering? No, in terms of this is one of the philodendrons that I will generally let go fully dry before I water it. This has also, even though it's in a semi-hydro mix, and it's in a self-watering pot. I have never had the reservoir in it. I think the only time I used it was last year during the heat wave because all of my plants were getting super thirsty. But yeah, this is one that generally will prefer to be slightly on the drier side for a bit longer. But really, I think that's the big thing. You can see maybe a support stick that I've got in here. You might be able to see it right there. Where is it there? So janky support sticks for the win again with this one, but it doesn't really need it. I just, I want to give that growing stem just a bit more structure because this can get a bit top heavy. It's not hugely heavy. It's, I don't know how to describe this. This feels like, you know, sometimes you get some plants and they're quite dense. So the more leaves it has, the more it will want to kind of pull itself down to the ground. This is quite an airy plant, if that makes sense. So the petioles feel quite spongy and yeah, they're not hugely, hugely dense. So it doesn't need it too, too much, but I do want to give it some support. Does it need it? Probably not, but it makes me feel better basically. So coming into final thoughts and having said everything that I've said before, let me benchmark this the same way that I normally do at the beginning of this section and say, knowing what I know now, and if I didn't have this plant, would I own this? This might surprise you. Yes, 100%. I would have this plant as well. Is it slow? Yes. Am I the most impatient person on the planet? Possibly. Is that a deal breaker for this plant with me? No. I do really enjoy its kind of foliage. It's very unique in the way that it looks. It's got those orange petioles when they do come in that can be kind of a bit more exciting. I like this plant. I do like this plant. And to be fair, because I've got such a large collection and a lot of the other plants might need a bit of babying, this one kind of doesn't. It kind of does its own thing. Do I think the prices are still ridiculous? Yes. Do I understand why the prices are ridiculous? Also, yes. So it's an interesting one. I think if you're buying something to make a quick buck, 
I don't think this is the one. Yes, there is money to potentially be made by buying this and chopping it and propagating and all these things, but it's not going to be a get quick, get rich quick scheme. <laughs> Basically, it's not quick. But do I think it's worth it as a plant? 100%. It's very, very, very cool. And it's very unique in the way, in the format that it is. And I do know that it looks like some of the other strappy leaved kind of aroids that we might have in collections. But I still think this is quite unique. That really deep sinus there, the ruffling on the leaves, the petioles, the way that it grows, all of these things are to say that this does add some interest for me in my kind of space. And again, because it's because of the way that it grows, even when you start pulling the petioles up, this isn't ever going to be a hugely tall plant. So that is something that's good. Now in terms of score, and hopefully I'll find what the original score is added at the top there, a year later, what score would I give this? And this might surprise you, and I think this might be slightly off from what I kind of scored it last time. For me, this is an easy eight or a nine. I do really enjoy growing this, I have to say. Um, for a lot of other people, because of the slowness, because of the price, because that it's not always as available, all of these things, I think, a more general kind of overarching score for this would probably be a six or a seven. There's challenges with it, there's the price, there's the speed, there's all of these things. So I would imagine that's probably where it would benchmark for most people. You might be very similar to me and you might end up scoring this higher. The, uh, the kind of side note, because I touched a, quite a bit on the variegated form of this, would I go out of my way to get the variegated form of this? Probably not. The level of irrigation on this plant for me and the way that it patterns out and even the leaf structure to a certain point is very similar and I'm trying to see if I've got a leaf so I can show you I've got some that are propagating I might actually just add um, a clip here so you can see very similar to the burly marks variegata very very similar not the same but very very similar a lot cheaper in terms of the plant and a lot faster after it gets established I would probably go for that to get that same vibe that you would get for this one, the variegated form of this one, and save quite a bit of money. As I said, I'm not pooing on the price in terms of how expensive it is. Normally I would do, but I get it with the variegated form of this plant. For me personally, I wouldn't spend that money because I just don't want to spend that kind of money on a plant, but that's my own personal thing. No shame on anybody who does want to do that, but that for me is a cheaper alternative to get the same vibe and aesthetic essentially. The green one is slow enough as it is, I don't need to be adding even more time to the whole process basically. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say on this update review. Hopefully you've all enjoyed. If you've got this and you want to leave your own review, like I always say with these videos, I do encourage you down in the comments below. And yeah, hopefully I shall see you all soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.